So now I would like to introduce uh, the first keynote presenters, Victor Temprano and Samantha Martin Ferris. And I understand we're being live broadcast out there to the world, so I'm hoping that there are family members of both of our keynote address, uh, our keynote uh, speakers here uh, online, so um, we, we welcome everyone worldwide. Victor Temprano holds a master's degree in religious studies from McGill University. He works as a web developer and owns a small startup in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's also a settler who lives in Vancouver on the unceded territories of Musqueam, Tsewa'atooth, uh, and Squamish people, and began the native-land.ca in um, 2015 after attending protests regarding pipeline construction in British Columbia. Samantha Martin Ferris is a Gitsan researcher from the house of Delgamuk. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of British Columbia in First Nations and Indigenous Studies. While her background is primarily in statistics and policy, she is always looking at new ways of um, investigating through indigenous lenses, through technology and decolonial practices. She comes from Hazleton, British Columbia. So please join me in welcoming uh, Victor and Samantha. Welcome. All right. Mic's on and everything? Cool. Uh, all right. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks for the land acknowledgement. It was cool to actually hear a little bit of a follow-up on the land acknowledgement instead of just saying the nations or the treaties. Um, something we notice a lot is that as land acknowledgements are becoming more popular, they're kind of becoming just this thing you just say at the beginning of whatever you're going to do anyway. So it's nice to hear about at least commitments to wanting to investigate the history further or make a real impact on lives of Indigenous people today. Um, so yeah, thanks for inviting us to this conference. Uh, it's definitely colder here than in Vancouver. Uh, <laughs> um, so I never even really thought about what, I, what native land is as a digital humanities. I'd never really even heard of that term uh, before uh, this conference. But it's interesting, and we have talks at the conference coming at digital humanities from so many angles, from people that are at their own projects or talking about how digital might affect how we interpret information. Um, doing analysis with digital methods, uh, just thinking about digital. Um, I think native land certainly belongs under the digital humanities, but I had to think about what that term really meant when I was uh, thinking, how does it belong? Um, so I am trained in the humanities, I'm religious studies, though it's been a few years since I finished that, uh, that degree. And so, uh, but native land didn't come out of that. It wasn't an academic project. It's much more amateur. I'm not a cartographer, I've never been trained that way. Uh, I'm not really a scholar, like I do have the degree. I'm a self-taught web programmer. So it's really a mix of academic and non-academic, which I think is something that comes out a lot in digital humanities. And it's one of the things we have to negotiate uh, when we're working in the digital humanities. So from my corner, I think digital humanities, uh, I think of digital humanities as some kind of argument, um, an argument about social, cultural, historical uh, things humanities issues that just takes form primarily in the digital medium. So there'll probably be lots of different definitions and this conference having gone on for years, there's probably lots of people who have thought pretty deeply about this. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, but I think my training in the humanities gave me some sense of rhetoric and how to make an argument and then put that together with some skills as a web, like hobby web programming. And there you go, there's digital humanities. <laughs> So we're going to split our time about in half. Uh, I think we have just under an hour or something like that. Hopefully you can get in some questions and, and things. Um, I'm going to give you a view more from kind of the ground level, like practically how was it built, what are the problems, what are the things we do. And Sam's going to do a bit more theoretical kind of stuff. Um, and Sam's our project manager with Native Land. She just started part time last year. Uh, so she's still a bit newer than, of course, me to the project. But she's done quite a lot, especially with our new education guide that we put out. Um, so our hope for the talk is one that you're going to get like a little bit of inspiration, direction for whatever projects you have going on or in the back of your mind. And also that you can help us like investigate some of the harder questions about Native Land, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what's some of the basic questions about native land. There we go. Uh, 
So I usually introduce native land as like a site that attempts to map indigenous territories, treaties, and languages across North America and increasingly the world. Um, could say that, could also just call it a hobby project that got really out of hand. Um, but the site is basically a simple idea. So you just have, you know, there's, there's a map, you can put in your address, and you search, and it pops up with some results. Um, so you search, blah, 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 and there's what we get for roughly around here. Now, this isn't the same as what our territory acknowledgement is, and it always freaks me out when people use this for territory acknowledgements, because I wouldn't. <laughs> I would use it just as a general guide to start researching from here, you know, to start looking at a lot more information. Uh, it may be wrong, so I'm going to talk about that more. Um, and that's basically the whole flow. You can move around, you can turn the labels on and off, turn off and on uh, quote-unquote colonial labels. Uh, there's very little ad additional information here, so there's no like indication of the sources. There's uh, no years are given as to what these are. Um, there's no, none of like the reservations. There's no pronunciation of how you say these different names. So it's actually really simplified. Uh, and that's a pretty key way that I, I look to make it. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, some general facts. So it started in 2014 slash 2015. And yeah, there was like this pipeline protest I was at. I've been activist for quite a while. And when I was there, I wanted to develop like a, um, a resource that would just help us see more of the resource development projects that were going on in British Columbia. Uh, so I started mapping out, you know, LNG and pipelines and stuff. And then I wanted to see whose traditional territories these were happening on, because that was something we were often talking about. And as I started then finding some sources and mapping out uh, territories in British Columbia, it, I kind of realized that this was its own project. So it started to kind of spin it off into its own thing, added the search, and then there it was. Um, it did t take quite a lot of time. I had never done any kind of mapping thing before. So I did have to learn how to do mapping. And now when I look back, it looks like, oh my god, I really didn't know. Um, but you learn. You learn along the way. So uh, I can talk more about the GIS stuff if people want in questions. I know we have some pretty complex mapping talks coming up pretty soon. Um, but I'm not going to get too deep into that. Just a couple things I want to mention. One is the overlapping shapes. That's something people often comment on with native land, is that we don't have these borders being contiguous. Um, it's extremely uh, intentional. Like <laughs> The idea of me having to figure out whose borders go where is really hard. So if two nations were to overlap, who am I to say which one's wrong? So I didn't want to engage with that at all, and I'd rather have it overlap. And the longer I looked at that, the more it just makes sense in general as a, as a way to map. Because so often in history, ac across history, across peoples, borders aren't like that. They aren't solid. That's much more of just something people draw because it's a little easier to deal with. But people do share territory. Things go back and forth. Sometimes you also have hard lines. Maybe geographical features make hard lines. But I think the overlapping shapes is, is really good for just against, it, it, or for starting to break some ideas of normal Western cartography. Um, for our sources, we use basically four types or four degrees of sources. Uh, we start off, the firm, one I would like to use the most is a map that's from the nation itself in whatever way we can get that. Maybe they have a website or maybe if someone emails us with like their official map. Um, but a lot of the time that's not, that's not a thing. Uh, a lot of nations don't have that, don't have the resources to do it or it's just not that important right now. There's other things to deal with. Uh, so if you don't have that, then we would look for a s study that's been done about that specific nation. Maybe someone's written a book or something. Um, and if that doesn't exist, which also often doesn't exist, then we will just use like a big conglomerate map. So like one of these big maps is just like generally the whole US or the whole Canada, which is full of weird inaccuracies and their borders do not overlap and there's all kinds of issues. The names might be bad. Um, Again, but we use it. Then if those don't exist, then we would use like basically anything we can get our hands on, any little map, even if it's old colonial one from the first ships that came over. Um, now part of that, the willingness to use sources that might be um, not so, so credible is partly about not having blank spaces on the map. Um, people are searching this and looking for their location. And if we can't, if we know that there's a nation kind of roughly in an area, but we don't draw anything, when people search, they might say, oh, there's no, I guess there was no indigenous people where I live. And so we, 
err on the side of putting something there and hoping it gets fixed up, which that's, that's problematic, but that is kind of the angle that we've gone at. And it makes sense in terms of the argument that the site is making, as I'll go into a bit later. Um, so there was also, aside from JS, there's also some design decisions that I made just purely on the site. Um, again, the simplicity is really important, uh, especially when it comes to people accessing in mobile, super important. You have to prepare for mobile. More than 50% of the users are mobile, so not to mention the app, so there's that. Um, and I wanted to make the argument of native land, which is about colonialism, about complicating colonialism, uh, implicit in the design so that you almost couldn't engage with the site at all without at least engaging with the basic premise of, of complicated indigenous histories that are right where you live. Even if, you're, even if people are gonna uh, run into it and say, oh, I don't buy any of this, they, they've already started thinking about it and that's what I really wanted to do. Um, in terms of its growth over time, uh, yeah, top days are usually around 150,000 uh, views. Those tend to come on holidays that, have to, that are uh, related with Indigenous people. So Thanksgiving is a big one, uh, Aboriginal People's Day in Canada. And also, I don't know if it's still Columbus Day here or Indigenous People's Day. I don't know if it's some states are doing it one way or another, something like that. Anyway, that day is really busy. <laughs> Lots of people come, uh, which makes sense, of course. But so around 2,000 people a day normally, that's without much additional promotion. We're mostly just working in the background. So in terms of actual websites on the internet, it's a medium-sized site. Um, and it does get shared a lot, as probably some of you have seen on social media. It tends to go crazy pretty quick <laughs> once, uh, once it starts getting shared. And it, we are a nonprofit now, um, and talk, I'll talk a little bit about that, but basically moving into being an organization, indigenous-led, indigenous-run, and there's all kinds of stuff about that. Uh, funding, hopefully one day, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, and we have had quite a bit of help from uh, Mapbox as well, which is a mapping, digital mapping. They provide for free our services, which otherwise would cost like five grand a month or something. So really nice. Um, so there's just a, some of the views. You can see it's quite spiky, that kind of thing. Uh, but ongoing, and that's just this past year. So obviously it goes back a few more years than that. Mm. And the first time it went kind of viral was in Canada in 2015. And that's what made me think like, oh, I gotta make it go viral in the States because that's 10 times as many people. Yeah. Uh, so I had to start mapping the States then, <laughs> which is a lot of work. Um, so, okay, some hard questions because that's the fun stuff here. Um, so there's a lot of difficult and interesting questions about specifics of native land, particularly when it comes for who's, who goes on the map. Um, so, one of these, so one of the questions there is like, what is it to be an indigenous nation? Like, is that about people having status cards? Is it about people having government recognition that they're an official tribe? Is it about uh, size of membership? Like, do you have to have a land base continually? Um, do you have to have 100% indigenous blood? Like, it, there's all these questions like, who are the people that we're trying, that I'm trying to map here anyway? Um, some people have some people have recommended using like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as a help to figure out who kind of belongs on the map, uh, which is an interesting idea. Uh, you also get into things. I don't know if you have the same in uh, states, but there's a large group Métis. I'm sure most people have heard of Métis. In Canada, there's like three groups of Indigenous people: Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. And Métis has just recently been recognized uh, federally in Canada, but there's still a lot of questions about. What exactly is Métis? What, what is the land base of Métis? What's the, does it overlap? And sometimes it runs into indigenous nations that aren't Métis. And who is indigenous? Again, it, it's, it's hard. And, and to be in the position of making those decisions is, is not, <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. So that's part of the trying to build a board, right? To deal with these questions. Uh, and then even more interesting, you get into other countries or other cultures. Like we do have quite a bit of South America or we wanted to have a lot more, but we keep getting stuck making fixes to the stuff we already have. Um, but in South America or Latin America, you might not have nations conceived quite the same way when it comes to indigenous people. You might have a bit more, it's about language or about dress, uh, something like ethnicity or, or town. It, it maybe is not quite the same idea of nation. So we've thought about maybe putting languages as the default tab when it comes to a Spanish language site, for instance. Um, so 
you kind of have to think about these ideas. And the map is ultimately meant to stimulate discussions about colonialism um, and about settler life and indigenous life, uh, kind of to just, yeah, really to stimulate that, have people start talking about it. And so there's also cases where people might email and ask us to map different countries around the world. So one of the ones I got early on that really made me think was someone messaged me and said, you should put Ireland on the map because they were colonized, obviously, and language was, was stolen, all kinds of things, right? And that's actually a really good point, is that shouldn't I put Ireland on the map? So I, I thought about that a lot, and it's still something that I'll, I'll present to the board, but it's a few years ago, and I didn't put Ireland on the map. And the reason was that the argument of the site, and this is the humanity, that the argument is, is, a, is reaching out to people like me, people in North America, and I know there's a lot of people who have Irish ancestry, and people who aren't really into like indigenous issues, who have Irish ancestry, who see this indigenous thing in, on Ireland might say, oh, hey, we're all indigenous. Like, what's the big deal? Like, do we really have to, yeah, you're indigenous, I'm indigenous, so we've been colonized, you've been colonized, so let's just call it even. And I was really afraid of that happening. So I wanted to make sure the argument was a bit stronger. But it's not to say that, okay, the Irish aren't indigenous, right? Or when it comes to, say, mapping Africa, or mapping somewhere like Iran, uh, who are the indigenous people of these places? Uh, it's not quite the same as here, where indigenous people generally aren't um, running the governments in, in Canada or the US. Uh, but Africans are running the governments in Africa. I mean, we can talk about you know, uh, col neocolonialism and all kinds of things. But it is different, because you're saying then that the nations of Africa are a little less valid because there's indigenous people uh, that have been silenced underneath it. And there, it's a little bit of a different discussion than what I'm doing with North America, where it's quite clear that there's still a colonial system in place. So those questions are quite hard, and I'm not sure about them. And that's really why the board has to be formed, or is formed, and presenting those questions and starting to struggle through them. Um, it's also a way to avoid having to do the entire world right away, because <laughs> it's kind of a lot of work. <laughs> so that helps a little bit, too. Um, so aside from just deciding who goes on the map, there's also questions about sources. So who can, who can tell me what an official territory is? Is it just anybody from a nation? Some random person emails me. Do they have to have some position of power? Um, what about organizations? I've heard in the States that there are some questionable organizations where they're kind of pay to join tribal membership. I don't really know a lot about it, but I've kind of heard about this. And those kind of things can happen, people claiming indigenous ancestry and then saying that, oh, hey, this territory is like this. And, and it's a little hard for me to evaluate, or for us to evaluate what's true in those. Uh, part of that, I think, is just about how, a question about how we handle sources in the digital uh, sphere. I know look, there's a couple of talks. One is Digital Sea of Memory, another is a living archive that might be touching on some of these, like how do you deal with oral history? How do you deal with all these different types of sources that could come into play? We're not just talking about typical old academic, like I just footnoted it uh, from a book. Uh, and how do we avoid just applying exactly the same source um, methodology to digital? Can we do something new with it? Um, then also students email me and ask, uh, can they use it as a source in their papers? which I think you know, it's pretty interesting because it's kind of like citing Wikipedia in my mind. It's not really reliable, but if, they're, but if people are citing it kind of as a critical, in a critical way, that, that makes sense to me, but I would not use it to cite that's who lived in a certain place because it's not that kind of project. It's not meant as an archival academic thing. It's a popular, quick, quick uh, engagement with the idea of colonialism. Uh, there's also the question that we are still using some colonial sources, so very much from, like, from the active colonial age. We could say it's still the active colonial age. I don't quite know how to phrase that time, but a few hundred years ago. And I wonder how much of those, just by using those and replicating them, is still replicating the same things that created those sources, the same ways of thinking, the same ideas. Uh, so I think those questions really have to uh, continually be engaged, and I just have to, we have to keep thinking about them as we're using them, and be willing to be like highly critical. I, I like being highly critical of the map, and uh, I, think, I think it's really important to do that. Um, see, oh yeah, and also years. Uh, <laughs> do we map, people have suggested putting time slider on the map, 
So you can see how the territories change over time, which good luck finding the sources, first of all. It's like really hard to do. But then also, it does kind of, again, get away from the core argument, which isn't about just so you can see how territories change. It's about you asking, what about the land I live on today? Uh, not an ancient thing. Uh, so those all play in. Uh, yeah, so we have a nonprofit. We have four members right now from uh, different parts of the world, different indigenous people from around the world. Uh, it's still just getting rolling. For me, it's been quite a slog <laughs> uh, setting up. Like I have this startup, but business is a lot easier set up than a nonprofit, uh, especially when you're trying to do it like with board members and stuff. So the next big thing is funding, so that it can start being a more sustainable organization. Hopefully, that I can step back into a more tech role rather than running the, the thing and managing. Uh, definitely would like to hire more. And if any of you guys are interested in it, it's definitely a lot of room to get involved because there's so much to do in this project, so many possible ways it can go. Uh, okay, so talked a bit about what's behind the map. Now, I want to talk a bit more about that, um, like how we frame it and uh, the argument. So over in the corner there, it says uh, search your address, toggle switches. I used to have a thing there that said learn more about where you live. Um, and I phrased that really carefully. I wanted to say, like, whose stolen land are you on? I wanted to come at people like that. But I, that, I knew that that was too aggressive because what I really wanted to do was make a tool that would get to people who already disagreed with me on indigenous issues, so to speak. Um, and I kind of felt like I had an advantage because I grew up with, around a lot of people who were somewhat racist, somewhat, like, not really interested in the whole indigeneity thing. And so I was like, I think I know how to talk to those people. I think I know how they might think. So I tried to craft an argument that would, that would reach those people. Um, so that's why I sometimes I call native land a rhetorical tool, because the way I built it, it has this argument embedded inside it. Uh, you can't, like I said, you can't use it without at least entertaining like the breadth and scope and complexity of indigenous history. Just seeing that makes you go like, whoa, <laughs> more here than I thought. And that's, that's the point. Um, I wanted people to drive around and notice names of roads or names of towns and go, hey, I wonder if that's the indigenous name. And that would maybe do something in their brain. Right? Um, so that's nice. It's nice to make something that speaks to the audience, that makes the argument. Um, the other side of that is that it is oversimplified to the point maybe of being watered down, to the point where maybe it just becomes a tokenistic thing like land acknowledgments can sometimes become. Uh, it's almost too easy to access, almost too easy to search. Uh, so I think that's a problem in digital humanities too, is that a lot of times digital things are just so easy and so fast to, to consume, and you have so many other digital things to look at that you just fly right through and it just gets at a surface level. Um, sometimes with a book, you can guide someone right through all your thoughts, but you can't do that in digital quite the same way. Um, so when I think about, again, digital humanities, um, try to get some kind of thinking about how what, what would I say when the next projects that I'm, I'm making or um, other thoughts kind of about digital? One, I think it's really good to ask if your project really needs to be digital. <laughs> so of course we're at Digital Humanities, so everybody's hopefully asked that. But the other part is that digital's super exciting right now. Everyone's super excited about it. And as a web developer, I know that everybody wants apps, everybody wants websites. Uh, but sometimes people, you know, if you're the dog walker, you might not need a website. You might just need a Facebook page. Right? You don't need an app. So in some cases, it's really good to just double check again that you're not just excited about digital, but actually it really has a core point in, in how you're trying to make your argument. Um, uh, so yeah, using your strengths. Uh, that's, that's kind of that. So if you do your analysis and the main thing is digital, that's exciting. And again, I emphasize the importance of simplicity. Uh, we have to have expectations, at least when it comes to internet kind of projects, of a quite flighty, easily distracted audience that's doing many things at once. They're probably listening to music, they're chatting, and then they're looking at this and talking with people about it. Um, so in that, uh, now who's the users? I kind of, that's part of what I want to talk about in the rest of this talk is just analyzing a couple of the types of users that email or interact and what it teaches us about about digital humanities, who we reach, and how they interact. Um, so one of those is to ask, like, who does the site impact directly, of course. And so I've had emails from indigenous people uh, mentioning that maybe it was the first time that they saw their nation mapped, and then that was a very powerful experience to help 
feel, feeling like really exist on the map. Um, and that's awesome. But it makes you ask, like, well, what, what is my responsibility here when I'm doing this? You know, it's actually really affecting people. Um, and then what about the emails I get or when, when we really screwed up? So, because we get those. <laughs> because, like, we might mess up a shape or completely miss a nation, just never even heard of it. Um, or the spelling's wrong, or the link can, must, has even gone to a site that's like anti against the nation. By accident, we just searched and put the link on there and it didn't do enough work, right? Um, so then maybe an indigenous person from that nation gets in touch and lets us know in no uncertain terms that we really made a big mistake and that it might, it's even kind of a continued erasure of their, their people because here you are, oh look, we have all the indigenous people and they're not there. And or, or they're mapped wrong. Or there's something typically that people typically always get wrong about their nation that's wrong again. And that's really frustrating for them. Um, and I, I really think that these kind of feedbacks are the most important. It really shows you that what you're doing matters because people are, are angry. And that first you're like, it hurts. You want to just take down the whole thing. <laughs> Say it's all garbage. <laughs> get rid of it. Um, but it makes sense because it's hard to value something if it has a kind of fatal flaw in it. And it's hard to see the work that's gone into the background of it if there's something so serious as an erasure going on. Um, ultimately, those emails do grow us the most because they, they're the hardest. The hardest teachers always teach us best, right? So um, another question is, who are your users sharing with? So I got one of the earlier emails that I got when I was first setting up was the first Thanksgiving that the site was up. Uh, it crashed because it had too many viewers, so cool. But a guy messaged me saying, um, that, oh, can you get the site back up? I'm back home with uh, my family for Thanksgiving. I want to show them the site and talk to them about colonialism. I was like, wow, isn't that cool? Like, people are spreading the site out amongst themselves. Uh, they're using it to make arguments to each other. And that made me again think, okay, the site has to be easy enough that, that people can get it, that people can show it to each other and they just get it immediately. Make it easy for them to make the argument they're trying to make. Um, then there's also questions of people using it, um, maybe you could say nefariously. I don't know if it's not maybe too strong. But certainly ways you don't anticipate or maybe don't want. So we get emails from government bodies once in a while. Uh, like we might get Indigenous Affairs in Canada, or I'm not sure the equivalent. I think we also get like Land Management, Bureau of Land Management or something here. Uh, sometimes they message us and they're like, oh, can you tell us who we have to consult with for this uh, project that we have going on? Uh, or like we're going government oh we're going out to do a survey somewhere who which nations <laughs> like and my first feeling is like first of all you have way more resources than us and you have the history behind you you have the documents you should do this research yourself but they don't a lot of the, a lot of the people in the departments or departments themselves maybe aren't interested in that it's too much work they don't want to call the nations have to actually talk to them they rather just look at the map Oh, there we go. OK, done. And that's really scary, because even though we have a disclaimer when the site opens to not use it for those kind of purposes, people are just going to ignore that. And you have to anticipate that people are going to ignore those disclaimers. Um, and I don't know really what we can do about that. Like, these companies and governments apparently think using this kind of crowdsourced tool is good enough for making policy decisions. Um, so it reminds us that big corporations, CEOs, people just trying to be politically correct, are also the audience. And they also experience that same blurring of academic and non-academic authority going on. Uh, and I really like monitoring this kind of harmful side of digital because of the uh, kind of hype that we get around it all the time. It's really good to think like, well, this might be used in other ways that we're not anticipating. And uh, how could powerful people twist this? I think it's really important to think about that. Um, so yeah, so in the bigger picture, um, I think, in the digital humanities, we're learning to communicate with each other like through these media, through these new different media. It might be online or it might be uh, just through analyzing data with different tools, learning how to take information out of this data and, and show it to each other and make arguments with each other. Uh, it is a space that has its inherent strengths and weaknesses, as I've tried to outline. Strengths in amount of information you can get out, the reach you can have so fast, uh, but also that to kind of tokenism or the oversimplified nature of what you can present, it can be an issue. Um, so yeah, I hope we'll all get a lot of chance to exchange ideas. You can ask us questions or I can ask you questions during this conference. Uh, I do love to work on new projects. So I hope that 
if one day ever my role with native land does decrease a little, that I can have lots of more projects to work on. So I'd love to hear your ideas and thoughts and criticisms, whatever you have. So thank you very much. Victor is definitely an ideas man when it comes to all this stuff. It's been really exciting getting to work with him as a project manager with Native Land and kind of getting to develop these kinds of ideas and navigate these no new colonial landscapes. So I just wanted to begin with um, a traditional land acknowledgement in my own language, Gitsanamach. Smigyat, Sirin Hanak, Guba Wurshwish, Lumao Gotzi Huech. Anishabawaki and three fires, Dimni Hiswich El Lek Yipdit. Lum Al Gotdit El Gabil Bechwich Dim Antnax Nil Dim Gwingala Las Nil Nilzum. I'm happy for all who've come to listen to our presentation today. Amiya. Thank you so much. So just like we talked about earlier, land acknowledgements are an important way for us to insert awareness on indigenous presence and land rights in everyday life. This is often done at the beginning of ceremonies and in this case, in the middle of talks. So it can be an explicit yet limited way to recognize the history of colonialism and for the nations as well as the need to change in settler colonial societies. So in native lands concept context, we're looking to acknowledge the existence of indigenous bodies in geography and how that they occupy land. So today I'd like to talk about the kinds of theoretical tools that we use to, in digital humanities projects and to decolonize with native land, um, particularly through an indigenous focused lens. So as for who I am, my name is Samantha Martin Ferris. I began in about September with native land working with Victor. We actually met through an interesting project. We met out at a Sundance actually um, on the Kainai Reserve where we ended up spitballing topics with a bunch of other researchers. Um, my native name is Tamit, which means thimbleberry in my language. It was because I was born a really small baby. So I'm an indigenous scholar and I'm a researcher with Native Ant, and I'd just like to share with you some of my own perspectives and stories that I've gained on incorporating indigenous cultural knowledge into media. So well, I wanted to just acknowledge that while I know that many of you in the room are probably more educated than I am, I'm hoping that sharing some of my views through my own cultural lens might give you ways to develop your own ideas and be able to frame your own projects in new and interesting ways. So a little bit of background on who I am. I'm Gitsan on my mother's side, and I come from a matriarchal society where women often take leadership roles. So when I was a little girl, my family used to go to the reserve three times a year when, when I lived back down in Vancouver. So we went once for Christmas, once for spring break, and once for the salmon harvest in the summer. So being Gitsan means coming from Hazleton, which is situated along the Skeena River, and the salmon runs up there every single year. So from my grandmother's house, it's only a 15 minute walk to Kassan, where you can see my uncle's fishing, and you can also see the old longhouses that my people used to live in. So in the summertime, my uncles would spend all day out on the river with the eagles, and they'd bring in the fish in big plastic tubs in the water. And it was then that my mom and my aunties and I would spend all day. We'd gut the fish, we'd clean it, we'd pack it up, we'd jar it. It was basically meant for all the people who weren't able to prepare the salmon such as the elders. So this is something that I, has kind of been ingrained in me since I was young. It's been this belief that we all take care of each other, including our land and the family. We used to basically, we used to take the salmon carcasses, and I remember my uncles used to joke, we're feeding the salmon sashimi. <laughs> so, so during all the seasons that I was present up north, I'd attend feast halls where my families and neighboring villages would gather, firewood, wolf, frog, and eagle. So the Gitsan Feast Hall is important for my people as it serves as both a form of recognition and expression of our land and our politics. We gather for feasts when we have something that we want to recognize, whether it's happy or sad, and we bear collective witness to the political issues happening, especially in nature to land and politics. So it's in this feast tradition that stories are passed on by our elders. We don't actually have a traditional record keeping system. Instead, we use oral histories to record. So it was in the, this kind of space that I learned how to express myself and I learned to start to situate myself as a researcher. It begins with small things like that. My Nana actually taught me how to 
basically present myself to people, and that's that my name is Tamit, and I come from Wilp Dawamuch, which is the house of people with chili ears. So the reason why I'm giving you all this information about myself isn't just because I want to stand up here and gaze at my belly button for a couple minutes. It's because I want you to know me as not only as a human being, but so you can start seeing kind of the stance that I took as I began to research topics with native land. So when we work as scholars, it's really important to know the relation to our projects because we start identifying the ways that we have to respect and define our work. To define the scope and range of my work with native land is to constantly be defining and redefining my view both as an indigenous person and as a researcher. In a couple of minutes, I want to discuss kind of the educational guide that we developed as an example of the navigation of space that I've kind of taken with media. But first, I'd like to set some groundwork on indigenous teachings, which has guided a lot of my research and in developing these different materials. So in indigenous teachings, the relationships between humans and land has always been discussed as indigenous peoples both hold up the land as a living being and as a teacher. Living lightly on the land has always been emphasized, both as a way for us to consider environmental impacts, but for also the way for us to kind of like think about how we live. Let me see here. So the indigenous scholar Leanne Simpson describes this as land as pedagogy, a way of teaching and knowing. Looking at the land from an indigenous perspective means understanding that land is a living being and that understanding both gives us insight and it increases our awareness of how we treat and interact with the land. From a classroom perspective, using land as a teacher allows us to breathe life into the maps that we work with, as well as imagine the land that we live on in new and exciting ways. So because we have so many different people viewing our site, we took an interactive image approach to um, the way that we wanted people to view it. For future planning, we'd like to try a more mixed media approach instead of just using a static kind of image that you can interact with. We'd like to incorporate more things, maybe like videos, you know, audio. But right now, we find that the mapping system that we use is works really well. We find that it allows for enough user engagement from different perspectives. So Native Land's biggest strength is that it allows for people to be able to put in where they're located and easily find out whose land they're on. This is often surprising for viewers, as they often imagine their space is just occupied by the state. This allows for a reimagining of colonial spaces, and it challenges a lot of colonial historical native um, narratives that occur in classrooms. Because of the crowdsourced nature of these materials, you're actually hearing real voices of indigenous people who want you to know that they're there. And it's not just in the past, but it's in the present. I find that when we kind of consider historical na narratives with mapping, we often actually consider indigenous peoples as in the past. So one of the weaknesses, however, is that a lot of this can be taken at face value and that deeper user engagement has to be ignited by the user themselves doing more research into cho their chosen indigenous topics. Like we were talking about earlier, some people want to pull it up at their family dinners, some people want to cite it in their academic papers, and some people just want to be able to give land acknowledgments simply by reading off kind of where, where these people are from. I was actually out at a conference pretty recently, and that was one of the things I was, I was talking with a bunch of business people, and they pull up the app, and I'm really excited, because it's like, what are you using the app for? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we just type in where everything is, and we just give our land acknowledgements, we just kind of fill that in there. I, I was a little bit nervous <laughs> as, as a scholar, because it was that moment of like, I, I usually, when I do land acknowledgements, I look it up with native land, and then I spend, you know, another 20 minutes just kind of like, Going, going through the rest of the research, I go citing my own sources and I kind of connect it to what our website builds on. So back in September when I started working with Native Land um, as a project manager, me and Victor started talking about the development of an education guide. So since the majority of our viewers are academics, students, and business people that already have a reason for coming to the site, we thought it'd be interesting to instead gear it towards elementary to secondary school teachers to give them materials to talking about decolonizing in schools. As well as a basic guide to native land, we decided to include some exercises that teachers could use in their classrooms to get more involved. And I kind of want to evolve on that story and concept in a little bit. So, Around this time, to get a better idea of the exercises that we wanted to do, I actually met with Jim, one of our volunteers, to do some planning. He has a background in managing art projects as well as graphic design, so I figured it'd be a good way to plan our ideas with him. So we sat down and we discussed the layout of the actual guide, which was fairly simple. 
and straightforward, but when we got to actual, the actual exercise contents, I find that we both had very different knowledge and very different lens and scopes. So going back to scope, I realized that we had different levels of knowledge on colonization as well as academics and settlers and where settlers were involved. So it was at this point that it struck me not only how challenging it would be to develop the guide to accommodate for so many different levels of knowledge, but also of how many different levels we were trying to express land itself as not just a static flat image. This brought me to the conclusion that everybody has a different way of relating to the land and that the main challenge with creating this project was a way that everybody could view their own lens and scope in native land and use land as their own pedagogy. So going forward, this kind of meant taking a mixed media approach to the development of our education guide. Um, this meant for videos to to show teachers um, so that teachers could show their students. It also meant, though, to have actual like, citable academic resources that teachers could be viewing so that they could be better communicating these kinds of materials to their classrooms. And it also meant kind of developing fun exercises that students actually felt like they could start imagining the land outside of the classroom. We kind of took a mixed methodologies approach to the development of the exercise as well. We wanted to emphasize both inside classroom learning and outside classroom learning um, so students could start imagining sort of like where they, where they positioned themselves as whereas indigenous people kind of came into this picture. We also decided to include a set of advanced exercises that are meant to just um, address the heavier layers of decolonization as well as developing your own media in relation to the land. I actually had a lot of fun with that one. We take, um, we do some podcast, podcasting and stuff like that, and we kind of have people podcasting out on the land and relating that to their own projects. So the strengths of this project are definitely that we consulted a lot of people. We did feedback with a number of academics as well as teachers and indigenous people into what they were looking for with us in terms of a guide. There was a lot of different opinions kind of like floating around, and the general consensus though was that everybody wanted a way that they could think about the land. So I think that a weakness with this project, however, is that it's been specifically developed from a BC-focused lens um, with Indigenous land. I can say that Indigenous people in BC, we live in a beautiful place, and the way that our laws are currently working are currently in development and ever-changing, and because of that, that's kind of how the lens of this project was made. I think that we really need to be able to adjust it to fit more of a global lens as we start looking at places. You know, I'd be excited to see like what an Ireland, you know, like colonial mapping project would look like with exercises. Um, in the future, I want to see this turn into a global project, but I think that right now it's really interesting that we're able to look at things from a BC lens, and I'm hoping that people will be able to start seeing from their own lenses as well. So, just to kind of like conclude. I'd like to just say thank you to everybody in my language. Dimgak buch, simigyat, laksa, nihism, dimgit, guts, lil, mit, midal, and lu, otsim. The cradle bless you and fill you and replenish you with what you've used. Nana, if you're watching this, I tried my best with the pronunciation. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And I think that we just wanted to open it up for questions yeah, now. Yeah, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Can you just say that we're going to do questions yeah. for about 10 minutes? And we have a microphone runner, so I'll leave you the to manage, but if sure. you want to talk. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. 10 minutes, questions? Yeah, any thoughts, questions? Um, thank you so much for this fabulous talk. It's so inspiring and interesting. Um, I'm Amy Derogatis from Michigan State. So my question is, have you had any experience with um, maybe in your email correspondence with people who do not want to be mapped or um, have reasons that they don't want to be visible? And how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with those kind of null or blank spaces on the map? Right. Yeah, so I actually haven't run into, I don't know if I've got an email directly, for, especially from a, something that 
could be, it's, again, it's hard to consider who emails you, right? When someone emails you and says, this whole site is terrible, take it down right now, which I've got, right? And maybe it doesn't give a lot of reason, or maybe there's some kind of theory, like I can tell there's some theory behind it, but it's a little hard to draw out the meaning. It's hard to take that, to know what to do with that, when that happens. Uh, I don't know if I've got one specifically from a nation that is uh, saying, like, we don't want to be mapped. I, when, I just, when it comes to mind, no, I don't think I've actually had one say that. But it's really, when I think about one of the projects I'd love to do is a place name map. Right, a place name map would be really fun, really cool. And that's much more in that zone because the, the shapes, the geography shapes themselves are, are vague enough that you don't have a lot of really sacred information or really particular information in there. Uh, but place names, you start to get into a lot of very close personal detail. And those, I would, those you'd have to run by individually past the nation. Um, and when it comes to blank spots on the map, yeah, it's, it's tough. I don't want there to be blank spots. Especially because I know the whole place was, is inhabited, has been. Um, and then it's just about trying to, uh, yeah, basically we try to not, we don't try to fill them, right? We try to then look up more about that area and see if we can figure out what's going on. But ultimately, if, if a couple sources come to us and it ends up being blank, okay, that's, it's okay. It's not like a, we absolutely have to make sure they're full. So if the sources end up pointing like that. Uh, we had one, uh, particularly with Haudenosaunee, uh, territory because that's kind of a confederacy and also there's large land claims but not necessarily traditional territory inhabitant. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to negotiate that. So you end up with some blank spots and then people email you and say, hey, fill that. The hot sun you're supposed to be there. So then we readjust the map and put it back on. So it's a lot of continual adjustment. Yeah, if I can speak from a recent experience, I find that the bigger issue is is that the way that the different bodies are moving kind of, we were we were um, helping to kind of do some further research into land claims, and I remember as a researcher even I was surprised because I, I went to look and, um, yeah, out, out in um, Vancouver, we, we typically um, acknowledge the Sellatooth, the Musqueam people, the Stolo, as well as the Kwantlen, and all of a sudden I found this new name popped up and as a researcher it was startling to me to see that but I did my own research and I started phoning up I phoned up the bands and I was just like to them what, what's happened with the space and they're like oh yes we're currently involved in a land claim for the, for this space out in Richmond Vancouver and it surprised me actually with the way that it was migrating Oh, I want to thank uh, thank you for your presentation. I have been following you <laughs> all the time through Facebook and Twitter, Thanks. and we're also one of our project. Um, we're working on a project that is called United Fronteras, and the first project that we are mapping it's your project initiating with the indigenous land. And I wanted to ask you. Um, I'm a scholar and working on a PhD, and I have working on projects, how do you maintain those projects without any funding? <laughs> be um, working, be, being really committed to your community because I see that your project, it's like our projects that we're committed to this community and that's what it's moving you to continue these projects. How do you balance that? Yeah. And why is that really important for you, both of you? <laughs> um, yeah, great question. And it's, it's hard to maintain. I mean, I find it personally difficult, especially after a few years. Like, you know, I've gone through burnout enough times with this. Um, and that's part of me wanting to, at some point in the future, step back to a bit more of just a technical role, rather. Because I find taking on all the leadership stuff, right? All the management, you have different part-time employees. You got to set up the board, you got to arrange board, board meetings, set up the bank accounts. It's so much of this other stuff, right? And that's really tiring. Um, and so that part of the maintenance I find really hard. But just the purely keeping it going, um, especially without funding. Yeah, so the without funding, that's, that's really because I happen, you know, I have the time. I have the time and I had enough funds that I didn't, it wasn't like crucial. You know, I don't have kids. I don't have like all this, these huge financial commitments. And that is, that is a big part. So I think there's a part of that where, you know, okay, so maybe you don't have funding yet. Well, do you have, do you have a couple thousand dollars? Can you, can you put that aside? Because if you do, that can really be a lot to get you rolling, and then you'll get funding along the way, <laughs> you know, if it's a really good project. 
So it's kind of a hard uh, answer because I don't, I didn't, there is no real, uh, didn't get much donations, and none of that. Um, just is really important, is really important, like you said. And um, at times when that would get, it, it, the money aspect was never the biggest, is the time, right? The continual time, the continual mental space of that, like every day, got to answer those emails and deal with the email. Um, but the community aspect is what brings you back, absolutely, and gives you that strength. So someone emails you to say, hey, thanks, like I've been using this for years, or even what you just said, you've been following us. It's like something in me is just like, oh God, you know, this has been worth it, hasn't it? You know, but it's hard to remember when you're just working with that computer. So if you can't, if it's re if you can't get feedback from the community, it would be really hard to continue because you don't, it just feels like you're just pushing against a wall. So yeah, hard, hard, hard thing to handle. I don't quite know how to do it myself, although it seems to have not worked out so far. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you deal with languages, um, and especially the sort of uh, colonialization of languages, the development of hybrid languages, pigeons and creoles, and things like that. Uh, how, how you conceptualize those? Like if we put them on the map or anything like that? Uh, yes, because I saw that there was a slider for uh, the inclusion of languages. So yeah, if you put them on the map and how you think about them. Yeah, so like when I originally made it, I was like, oh, cool, I found some. In, in, in BC, there's, there's quite good traditional territory maps. A lot of the time, that's because nations are unseated, so they haven't made a treaty. So the government provides money for people to map their traditional territory so they can give it up in a treaty. That's a lot of what goes on. So there's great traditional territory maps. You don't have it for the rest of Canada, right? But a lot of those traditional territory maps were also language maps. So at the beginning, I was like, oh, cool, I'll do territories and languages. That'll be easy. Um, and then I threw in treaties because some people in Canada identify themselves as like, I'm from Treaty 1 territory or I'm from Treaty 7. That's a way that people sometimes identify themselves. So I use those. Um, the languages one, a lot of times it's kind of the same as the nations. Uh, a lot of times those are quite overlapping. Uh, when it comes to, yeah, kind of mixed languages, Again, I'd be happy to put more diversity on the map. I think more there is better because people are going to then have a chance to do more of their research. Oh, what is this language? I've never heard of this language before. And maybe um, there's quite good like indigenous language resources online. Generally, it's better than the territory resources. So there's some websites that have pronunciation guides and things like that. So we try to direct people to those. Um, <clears throat> I've also wanted to in the past, I've wanted to kind of do like language families, like kind of color them by language families. But it, it personally, I, I think it just proved too difficult to really have to continually do that research. So yeah, in, in general, with languages like more is better, we're pretty happy to put more on there. And uh, yeah, and a lot of times it overlaps with the nations themselves. I don't know if that answers some of your question. Or I think it really um, reflects, though, the non-static kind of like relationship of territories and things like that. I mean, like the better question is, is like, who are we to deny, you know, pigeonization of languages or like hybridization? I think that languages are constantly in an evolving state. But I think that if a specific nation had a problem with us kind of like listing that, then I think that that's definitely an ongoing conversation that we would have with the nation as well. Yeah, there's one other part, which is that, you know, in a city, you might have a lot of indigenous people speaking a lot of different languages. So what do you do if you're trying to map like modern day at the same time as kind of mapping like historical, how do you deal with those? So in general, we would just leave it. Like don't try to do the city with everybody who's in it. It's a little too hard. So we go with something more traditional or whatever, historical, I guess you could say. Okay, we have one a time for one final question. Actually, it's gonna come from online, um, but I. After that question is done, we're going to have a break, and we'll come back at 10.50. This clock back here is fast, so don't rely on this clock back here. Um, uh, and then we'll get started with lightning talks. So the question from online is simply, what software is used for the Native Land Project? And that comes from Ellen Tisdale. Uh -huh. Great. So it's just um, your typical web stack. So the, the first time I built it was just HTML, J JavaScript, and CSS with Google Maps was originally what I used for it. So Google Maps has an API that you can build out custom maps on, right? 
And as the data got bigger and bigger, it started to get slower and slower because you can't have that many data points. And so Mapbox really became the best one. Mapbox, you can pre-render stuff. I'm not, I don't work for Mapbox, I'm not ads for them. But, <laughs> but it, it's good for the data. And it also allowed a lot of like the coloring that you kind of see and oh, it looks pretty and it's cool, uh, which is big, which is important. Um, what other software? It is running on, like, like WordPress is on the site, but it's more of a management for the overall structure. It's not uh, core to the site. So I'd say the core techs are a mapping API, Mapbox, Google Maps, Leaflet, and then just your typical HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Right now, it's using React.js, if the person knows what that is, um, but uh, it, it's not necessary. 